first we need to start with a quick distinction, and I'm not gonna make a whole lot of hay about this, but we do need to distinguish, I think, what, we need to be clear what we're talking about. There is a distinction between postmodernism and postmodernity, uh, that there's a postmodern way of thinking, I guess, a, a constellation of ideas that we generally call postmodern, NIST or postmodernism, and there's a, a condition, a kind of situation that is postmodern, postmodernity. Um, and in that way, uh, all of us, one could argue, are postmodern because of the air that you breathe. I mean, for instance, one way that we often uh, kind of distinguish postmodernism from postmodernity is, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, modern modernity from postmodernity is modernity is a world that is shaped by the industrial revolution, the uh, invention of uh, mechanical la or mechanized labor, and so on and so forth. The kind of political manifestos. I mean, that is the world of modernity usually. Um, it's the mechanical age. Whereas something else has happened, we're just not in so much of a mechanical age, or we're past it. We're in an information age, where uh, if, if the, the printing press and the uh, um, high-rise building and uh, those sort of things defined uh, modernity, post-modernity looks and is organized not in the kind of modern grid of the city and the production and those sort of things, but it's organized more like the internet, right? It's the exchange of information, it's globalization, uh, that there are multiple languages, there are multiple um, ways of thinking all in contact with each other. And the way that it's organized doesn't, ha it's not a grid, it doesn't even have a center. Like where's the center of the internet? The, s the internet is not a stable thing. <laughs> it gets added to and revised and there's no s center. It's just a series of relationships of people exchanging information and exchanging ideas and it's a whole lot noisier, and to some extent, uh, one could refer to that as a postmodern situation or postmodernity. You may question that and say, well, I guess it's post in terms of coming after modernity, but it maybe might more be articulated as a hyper-modernity. I mean, maybe we just have gone past by going more intense. <laughs> We're hypermoderns or ultra-moderns, and that might be the case, you could argue that, but we'll use post um, real broadly to designate a kind of step beyond modernity, a step beyond the uh, mechanical age to the information age. Um, from the factory to the internet. I mean, inter the internet really is the postmodern paradigm. Uh, so then what do we think about postmodernism? How is that different? What is this constellation of ideas that uh, um, we can call postmodern or refer to as postmodern? Uh, perhaps once again, it's a kind of heightening of m modernism. If modernism, like modernity, was preoccupied with kind of rationally organizing our lives and our societies and rationally organizing our philosophy and our mathematics and our science. Science is like the paradigm, the paradigmatic discipline of modernity. Everything became a science, right? Uh, everything is a science where you get things down to their basic elements and you understand and explain how everything works scientifically, objectively, using evidence. If that's a kind of modern disposition, postmodern disposition is going to call that into question. Um, your ability to explain everything scientifically and to get to the bottom of things. Um, and I guess if we had to have a, a kind of general way of describing this constellation of postmodernism, we might say, that it's the assertion that there's no neutral place to stand. 
the whole idea of, of kind of making everything a science and explaining the world in rational scientific terms often has presupposed that you can get enough distance from it to just look at things as they are and to put everything together. But the question the postmodern has is where are you standing while you're doing that? Where are you standing? How, what are you bringing to the situation? <laughs> how, how are you uh, seeing things as they are without already being tied up in them, wrapped up in them? You can't get outside of a, you can't get to a neutral place to stand. Everything is interpreted from somewhere, through a language, through a history, through a culture. Uh, there's no neutrality. Uh, there's no neutral knowledge or neutral understanding, and thus that, that sort of calls the modernist scientific disposition into question. And you, you see why it would do that, right? You're, you know, science isn't detached, it's not removed. It is a cultural construct, <laughs> is what they would say. Now that doesn't mean that uh, there's no uh, reliable knowledge that, that postmoderns would say, yeah, science is great. Science tells us a whole lot about the world. It tells us a whole lot about electrons and, and neurons, and it tells us a whole lot about mass and movement, and all of that stuff is great. And most postmoderns would say, yes, yeah, that's great. It tells us a lot, and we get real knowledge from that. But it's not neutral knowledge. It is the kind of knowledge you get by being inside of of the system. And there are certain ways, uh, certain things that we want to know for certain reasons, and other things we don't want to know, and that's not neutral either. <laughs> Does that make some sense? So the, uh, you will be hard pressed to find a postmodernist who will be a total relativist, because total relativism is silly. It's self contradictory. And, uh, uh, most smart people aren't, aren't that silly. <laughs> They'll just say, uh, you know, it's not, it's not absolute relativism and you can never know anything, but it's relationalism. You only know things through relationships to things. And you gain real knowledge in relationships to other people, in relationships to institutions, in relationships to this thing. Um, but it's as me encountering this thing and being related to this thing. And it's a specific kind of knowledge. It's not absolute. Does that make sense? OK. The absolute language, though, is um, tricky. Perhaps we'll get back to it. OK. Um, so here's going to be my strategy here, because how do you get into this? There's too much to say. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, follow an outline, a rough outline, um, from a book by Jamie Smith, James K.A. Smith, called Who's Afraid of, Post uh, Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? Uh, Jamie Smith is, uh, I don't know, <laughs> He's prob he probably has a mixed uh, evaluation around here. Um, uh, some people like him, some people don't. Uh, but he, he's a philosopher who teaches at Calvin uh, College. He's, uh, he has been associated with the radical orthodoxy movement. Uh, an interesting guy, a Christian philosopher who is, has, thinks that postmodernism has a lot to teach us and to say to us, a lot in it that needs to be critiqued. But So he writes this thin little book that's called Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? It's very accessible. If you're interested in an introduction to postmodernism, that's a decent place to start. And he gives three thinkers and gives one quote from each of them. And I think it's a pretty concise way to introduce the idea. So I'm going to borrow really loosely his three quotes that he uses in that book. Now, the people that we're going to talk about are not, we've been talking about artists and art theorists. These people are not specifically art theorists. They're usually philosophers or social critics. Most, uh, they're basically philosophers. Um, uh, each of them wrote about art, the first two more than the last one. Um, but are extremely influential to the art discussion. So if you go to graduate school and you take any course in art criticism and theory, you're going to read 
something from these guys because they, it was very influential in um, art theory. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is Jacques Derrida. Have any of you heard of Derrida? Probably, yeah. If you've had any encounter with postmodern thought, it would probably be Derrida. Uh, he's certainly, the, uh, I would think, the most famous, the most well-known of them. And Derrida says this in a dense book <laughs> that you can go read and make some sense of it, but it, he says this. This is one of his famous lines. Uh, there is nothing outside the text. There's nothing outside the text. So what does that mean? What does he mean by text? He probably doesn't mean a book, like this book. There's nothing outside of it. I mean, he's not, he's not so silly as to say, you know, uh, you're, you're sort of, you're in a matrix or something, and you're just reading a, you're in a book or something. You're, you're, you're pre-programmed and there's nothing outside of that. Um, so what does he mean by text? He's obviously using it metaphorically. There's nothing outside of it. What would you guess? What does he mean by text? Yeah. Good, context or situation. And why would he refer to that as a text? Like this situation as a text? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, good. That it's got, that when I'm in a situation, it already has narratives wound through it. And if I, if I understand anything about the situation I'm in, it's in light of the narratives. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Al although, maybe, I mean, maybe he would, I love this idea of reading between the lines of a text. Um, I mean, maybe he wants to include that, that, that there is the surface read of the text, but there's also all lots, all sorts of things that are in between the text, the lines of the text. Um, but you're still inside of the text. <laughs> yeah, good. It's a dense text. It's a complicated text, and that's certainly true of the texts he wrote. Uh, they were certainly dense and complicated. Okay, good. I mean, when we, when we think of text, we think of information, narrative. Uh, we think of signs and signifiers, things in a book that we don't just read for what they are, or we don't just look at them for what they are, marks on a sheet of paper, but they become enlivened with other content, right? When I look at the marks on, this, on these pages, uh, they, they are loaded with significance beyond the marks, right? So meaning and hears in things as signs, as signifiers. Um, Okay, well, let's sort through this. I'll give you a couple of uh, ideas here of what this might mean. There's nothing outside the text. Uh, first, it probably means, it does mean for him, that there's nothing outside of interpretation. That if anything is intelligible to you, it's been interpreted. And he would regard that as a text then. Um, that, which you, that, that which is unintelligible and has no meaning to you is just outside of your consciousness altogether. So you might as well be totally oblivious to it for as far as you're concerned, right? Everything that you're consciously aware of, everything as opposed to the nothing, all of that has already been interpreted in one way or another. That whatever sense you can make of things, is interpretation. When this appears to me, it appears to me as something, as table, as chair, as person, as green, as rectangular, as whatever, but it always appears as something. And that is what he means by interpretation. If it's appearing as something, you don't get the thing in itself, so to speak, you get it as something intelligible on a, on a base level, 
right? What would it mean to come in? What is the table in itself? Well, if I'm saying, if I'm referring to it as a table, I'm already understanding it in one way or another, right? What is the thing in itself? It's not even worth talking about. Even that language, the thing in itself, is interpreting it as something. And, and this is one way of him saying, there's nothing outside of the text as far as I'm concerned. I don't think he means that whatever I think about the world, there's nothing outside of that. He doesn't mean that, as though it's just sort of, you know, <laughs> A, 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 total, a totally idealist situation. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I can't get outside of my own, interpret, my own interpreting of the world, my own text. I'm in a text. Okay. Um, so uh, that's a, perhaps a long way of saying meanings only exist as interpretations. If something means something, it is an interpretation. It is a text. Meanings are readings, so to speak. And in terms of art, I'll go back and forth between these, this theory stuff and artwork. Uh, as we looked at this morning, you certainly see that running through someone like Kosuth, right? <laughs> this whole problematizing of what is the chair, what is the chair, what is the chair, the chair is interpreted. It's always already interpreted if it's intelligible to you. It's a text. The chair is a text. And there are lots of different facets to that text, okay? Uh, and I think uh, we could deduce further from that uh, to say that interpretations, these meanings, are fundamentally linguistic. That seems to be implied in the idea of referring to it as text, understanding as text. Maybe that's a way of saying it. There's nothing, there's no intelligibility outside of text. <laughs> and as far as you're concerned, anything that's intelligible is, it, it, the, what's outside of it, you can't name it. Um, and so if intelligibility is a kind of text, then it seems like language is our model for understanding meaning and intelligibility. So interpretations are fundamentally linguistic they happen within systems of signification or sign systems. One thing, like the marks on this paper, referring to something else, signifying something else. Okay, and, and as with this morning, please stop me if any of this is like totally opaque. <laughs> is it totally opaque yet? Not yet, it's okay. Okay. Um, and in terms of art, we've got lots of demonstrations of this dynamic in, uh, in 20th century art making. Uh, famously by Magritte, this is not a pipe. What sense do you make of this painting? How do you interpret this painting? What is not a pipe? The image, so this, this thing, uh, where am I? This thing right here is not a pipe because why? It's paint, yeah, good. But what about this? This is not a pipe, canvas is not a pipe. What about this? Is this a pipe? <laughs> Perhaps the language itself, this is not a pipe, is referring to itself, its own, its own sentence. I mean, there's, there's no pipe, there's no pipe anywhere. Um, so then the question is, uh, what is it? If it's not a pipe, what is it? And we have lots of answers to that, right? It's canvas, it's paint, it's writing, it's language. It sort of unfolds like Kosuth's uh, works, where this is all sorts of things, uh, but not a pipe. Um, and that's perhaps the uh, purpose behind writing it in the negative. I mean, he could have said, this is a painting. 
but <coughs> by saying, well, it's just, it's not a pipe, then it unfolds and spins out into all sorts of other things that it is. That doesn't mean that it means anything at all, it's just that it means multiple things. Uh, multiple ways of interpreting this, and Magritte kind of interrupts how we normally use language, signification of written language, and the signification of representational painting. But we don't want to be too, ir we don't want to be irresponsible with that either. I mean, in a very real way, this is a pipe, right? I mean, in, in a real way, we look at it and throughout the classroom, we're all thinking of a pipe now. This does, this is attached to a pipe <laughs> in one way or another. Uh, it just, uh, uh, it, what he does is uh, sort of halts us. So we're thinking pipe, not pipe, okay, but it's still pipe. And, and we are drawn into this kind of sensitivity towards the way that paintings or te written text refers us to certain things. I always have this, I haven't read this anywhere, but I've had this question of whether Magritte specifically chose the pipe because of the way it refers to the mouth and language as a sort of a speech, as a kind of smoke. <laughs> this thing that's there but difficult to pin down, I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyway, is the pipe a kind of stand-in, a metaphor, an image for language? I don't know speech anyway. And a further question is, what is the treason that's involved here? We, uh, we can't go any further into Magritte, but uh, just as an example, and as we saw from this morning, um, certainly Weiner and a lot of the conceptualists are uh, deeply interested in the textual, linguistic functions of meaning or the way meaning is held, concepts are held in linguistic terms. And that, in some ways, the point of conceptualism is pointing that out, one of the points. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, Taylor brought this up, and I think it's uh, certainly relevant. It's nothing outside of interpretation. Meanings are already texts. Uh, and there's nothing outside of context. I mean, how do we read texts? If I pick up a book and I start reading it, I might just read the words and re start reading the narrative, but how is it that I make sense of those words and of that narrative? It's because I have come to the text already with an understanding of the language, and we've already decided that this refers to that and this refers to that, so I bring a context to it I bring a context, and it's not only a context where I understand the English language, um, but it's a context where I understand, like if it talks about a tree, I've had experiences with trees, and so I'm bringing that to it. So I know, I know not only what the word signifies, but I also know something about what it is signifying. But when we read those words themselves, their meaning arises from the context within the context of the other words, right? So, for instance, the term bat, or the word bat, is a, a kind of an ambiguous term until it is surrounded with context. Uh, I, I stepped up to bat is going to mean something different of that word than uh, I, walked, I walked into my cabin and realized there was a there was a bat flying around in it. I mean, I guess even there you could interpret it as a bat flying through the air <laughs> or whatever. Uh, it flew towards me, so I tried to bat it uh, away from my face. I mean, the word takes on meaning because of its context, okay? And there's nothing outside of meaning. Meaning doesn't, things don't become intelligible except through this context. Um, and uh, that's a way of saying meanings are interpreted based on the relationships between a thing and its surrounding context. And that's not only like with words of, 
words like bat, but it's also like larger phrases. Like if I say, it's going to rain tomorrow, what does that mean? Well, I need to know something about tomorrow and something about rain and something about it is going to and so on. But I also have a context in which that is heard. If I say it's going to rain tomorrow, if you're planning on going to Disneyland, that is going to strike you differently than if we're, um, if we're in a village in Burkina Faso, Africa, and they've been in a drought for three years. It is going to rain tomorrow means something totally different in that context than it does if you're hoping to go to Disneyland to celebrate your birthday or something like that. Okay, and that is what Derrida wants to refer to as text. All of that is text. The way we make sense of things is as a text because we interpret it and because we interpret it in terms of context. Um, uh, and this has always been true of all art, and I think um, Derrida would say of, of anything that makes sense to us. Um, um, even ancient things. Martin Heidegger has this wonderful passage where he's talking about the meanings of Greek temples. And I want to read just a bit of it because I think it highlights the way that we interpret uh, the world around us to some extent. He says this, standing there, the building rests on the rocky ground. This resting of the work draws up out of the rock the mystery of that rock's clumsy yet spontaneous support. Standing there, the building holds its ground against the storm raging above it and so makes the storm itself manifest in its violence. The luster and gleam of the stone, though itself apparently glowing only by the grace of the sun, yet first brings to light the light of the day, the breadth of the sky, the darkness of the night. The temple's firm towering makes visible the invisible space of air. The steadfastness of the work contrasts with the raging of the surf and its own repose brings out the surge of the sea. Tree and grass, eagle and bull, snake and cricket first enter into their distinctive shapes and thus come to appear as what they are to us. The temple in its standing there first gives to things their look and to men their outlook on themselves. Essentially what he's saying there is that it's a, a kind of unity of relationships and we see one thing in relation to the next. The earth, we, the, the earth appears to us as supportive and firm in the context of building on top of it. And the air feels, uh, appears to us as light and sort of surrounding everything in contrast to the stone that's set up right. And the temple appears to be stable and secure in contrast to the raging of the sea. And we judge one thing against another and we make sense of things based on their relationship to other things. Does that make some sense? Things appear as something, as a table, or as a temple in relation to this network, this context of relationships. Um, and the thing about that is that sometimes those contexts disappear. I mean, Heidegger goes on to talk about how the world of the temple has decayed, <laughs> has disappeared. The world, its world disappeared because the way that it made sense in the culture that built these things has dis, uh, has changed and we no longer understand it the same way. And it's been forgotten. The way that this meant something has been forgotten. The world has disappeared, its world, because the relationships have changed. And so the meaning of the thing has changed. Okay. Other, example, other examples from contemporary art. Here's a photograph uh, by uh, Gabriel Orozco who's an important artist that we'll come back to in future weeks. And what do you see in this photograph? What does this photograph mean? <laughs> how would you describe it? We won't even talk about meaning yet. Just how would you describe it? It seems like a view from the outskirts. 
Good. Good? Because you've got quite a bit of distance between you and downtown Manhattan. But why else do you view it as a? Because you're right by the coast, by the water. Good. So you're, you're by the coast? Good. So you feel a barrier between you and downtown. I mean, there is a barrier. What else? Yeah. Yeah, good. Good. So uh, uh, it appears to be a kind of Manhattan. There's a visual rhyme, even in terms of the size, a rhyme between this skyline, this island <laughs> in a body of water, uh, versus that island in a body of water. So you have these two skylines. And by setting up this kind of relationship, what do you think about that? I mean, this <laughs> is a skyline made out of discarded trash. And that causes that to appear as being wealthy, right? Powerful, a, a place of extreme um, um, stability and financial stability as well. In contrast to this, this shows up as poor, discarded uh, detritus, uh, perhaps from the city, uh, that it puts off debris like this. This is fragile, this is fleeting, this is insignificant, that is stable and um, significant, and so on and so forth. Uh, so because of this context, it shows, it makes that show up in a different way to us. And the whole thing shows up differently to us than to Orozco, why? I mean, look at that skyline. What does that skyline mean to you? Yeah, I mean, we look at this image and we're like, 9-11. <laughs> so strongly, those buildings, those two tall buildings are like a, a kind of haunting monument uh, that for us means terrorism, it means um, uh, kind of uh, an attack on our economy, an attack on uh, uh, the American way of life and all of those things. We look at this and we see loss and we see all sorts of things, perhaps anger at someone, <laughs> well, you know. Uh, and what is that? Why does this, does this mean that? I mean, the artist didn't intend to make any comments on 9-11. I mean, this is, this is uh, far before, actually, though, this is the first <laughs> attack on the World Trade Center. That's kind of interesting, in, in 93. Uh, uh, but he didn't at intend for us to read those twin towers in the way that we currently do, but we do. And in some way, we have to argue that this photograph means something in the context of 9-11. That's not what the artist intended. And the artist doesn't have control over what this means, because he doesn't have control over time and over, over context. Something has happened between when he took this photo and now, whereas if you were to look at that skyline, there would be an, an awful absence in the middle. And this means something in the context of that. Does that make some sense? Meaning shifts with context. And uh, in artwork, coming out of this conceptualist tradition uh, that we'll be looking into more and more, uh, uh, there uh, are more and more artists that are um, specifically making artwork to highlight the way that context shifts meaning. Um, Fred Wilson is uh, one artist who has done this. Uh, he had this work called Mining the Museum, in which he went into the Maryland Historical Society, is where it was, and he, uh, the artwork was him reconfiguring the museum exhibitions. And so he went and his only art objects was their collection. <laughs> he didn't bring anything with him, just their own collection. Um, and he reorganized the collection so that the thing really destabilized all of the 
exhibitions. So for instance, he puts on an exhibition or a kind of display of 19th, 18th and 19th century metalwork that is wild, isn't it? I mean, what do you see here? Normally what would be here is this wonderful silver work that is phenomenally crafted. But what else do you see? Shackles, slave shackles, which is 19th century metalwork. <laughs> uh, it's all metalwork, but somehow by uh, um, reconfiguring the collection so that this is displayed in the context of that, it throws them into conflict, meaningful conflict with one another, where now what would have been, we would have probably just appreciated as being wonderfully, f the kind of pinnacle of metalwork craftsmanship is suddenly now seen as op oppressive, right? Uh, uh, a kind of uh, this, at the cost, at dramatic human costs, the kind of metal work for luxury and enjoyment on the backs of human oppression and so on. Yeah? Yeah, I was going to say, it definitely confronts you with the truth because then it's looking at what's beautiful and you're confronted with what's actually happening with those shackles and metal. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it just, it, it makes it more complicated. I mean, truth gets more complicated. Or fuller, it's too big. I mean, because if this exhibition just included the silver work, there would be much to it that we would say, this is finely crafted, this is um, impressive, this is, et cetera, et cetera. There would be various truth statements we could make about it. But once you put this in the context of it, then it forms a different, set of meanings that are also true or false, depending. And then we could put, I mean, that, that system remains fairly open. We could put lots of things here uh, that would count as uh, 19th century metalwork that would throw this into sort of different meanings. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, this means anything at all, and that meaning is totally unhooked and totally relative, because that's not true either. I mean, if you put a, um, there are lots of things you could put here that would just, and conclusions we could draw from this that would be false and that would be um, inappropriate and so on. But uh, what is true about any given historical situation is really full and really multifaceted. So this would be one of the, this would highlight one of the truths of 19th century metalwork, for instance. <laughs> and, that, and once again, you shouldn't take that to mean that there's no such thing as truth, because that doesn't follow from this, it just is that truth is an awfully dense, complex thing, and we see truths uh, by way of their context and their relation to each other. And to a great extent, that's what education is and learning is, is expanding the contexts that you have in mind. Uh, when you understand any given thing or look at any given thing, right? Okay. Are you feeling bludgeoned yet? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see what I can do then. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to talk through this too much, um, but so context, meanings are, are relational to a great extent, and meanings are also relational to cultural structures and cultural linguist, linguistic structures. So far we've been talking about if you put this in context of this, it changes meaning. But what about the language that I bring to interpreting the thing? It takes on meaning in relation to that. And one way of saying this might be, or one way of thinking about this is anything I say or any object is part of a textile you can't just remove the word table and analyze it as its own thing. Because table has meaning because it's woven into a larger fabric or textile, and I think it's convenient that it shares a root word with text. <laughs> what are texts? They are 
numerous interwoven strands that make sense as a, a weaving, as a complex textile. Just as with a textile, if you start removing strings or start removing strands, the thing disintegrates and you don't have, it doesn't, doesn't behave in the way that it used to. It operates as a web or as a, a textile. Okay, some examples from artworks, some of which we've already seen. A rubber ball thrown on the sea. If, I, uh, if we put this on the wall, we make sense of it by virtue of the things that we bring to this. The things we bring to rubber, ball, thrown, on, the, sea. Those things mean something because of the way they are already embedded in the textile, our cultural textile, linguistic textile. And Baldessari, who I showed you earlier, the guy who did the everything has been purged from this painting, he goes on in the 80s and 90s and today, he's still making work, um, to experiment with the way that our linguistic, cultural linguistic textiles work, the way that the connection between signs creates meaning. So what Fred Wilson was doing by putting this thing in relation to that thing, Baldessari is doing by taking this sign in relation to this sign and adding signs, adding images that we have some associations with and putting them in connection with each other and creating these sort of open-ended narratives. And he disrupts them by removing certain figures and replacing them with colors and the way he relates them to each other form different narrative and different uh, kind of meanings, if you will. And it's that idea that gives us the uh, kind of an understanding of what the, or that's, that's the context in which the word deconstruction emerges. You've all heard of the word deconstruction, I would imagine. Uh, often we kind of use um, the word deconstruction to just mean destruction, <laughs> right? If you take something apart, that's deconstruction. So in popular language, uh, deconstruction has come to mean sort of any time you tear something apart or dismantle something. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk about deconstructed clothings and deconstructed songs and everything's deconstructed. Um, but really the way Derrida used that was it's a very conscious and very careful trying to pay attention to how something is constructed, right? It's not just dismantling and just taking apart. It is trying to recover and in Derrida's words, remember uh, how language is constructed or how meanings are constructed. It's a process of remembering and usually that happens, the way that we're drawn to, uh, our attention is drawn to it and the way we remember it is by interrupting. So deconstruction almost always uses strategies of interruption, which we've already looked at. But it's for the sake of uh, being conscious of the construction that's there. Dismantling it, yes, but dismantling it for the sake of understanding how it was holding meaning and, <coughs> and clarifying meaning or mediating meaning or whatever. Um, and specifically, he's going to use deconstruction to, to um, reveal the problematic ways that a system is operating, a language system or a cultural system. Here's, here's what Derrida says about this, if this helps. <laughs> I don't know. But to give you uh, one more quote from him. To deconstruct philosophy, would be to think in the most faithful interior way the structured genealogy of philosophy's concepts, but at the same time to determine from a certain exterior, and that is, I think, problematic, what this history has been able to dissimulate or forbid, 
by means of the simultaneously faithful and violent circulation between the inside and the outside of philosophy, this is a putting into question the meaning of being as presence. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have read that. That's just uh, going to be more confusing. But he's interested in disrupting the, f the work of philosophy specifically for the sake of revealing the way that it is shaping the way we think and so on. Okay. Um, and then lastly, as part of this uh, Derrida's quote, um, perhaps we would say not only do we get context, not only are there, is there context between the relationship between objects and the relationship of the objects to our language systems, but also their relationship to our presuppositions, the framework of beliefs and values through which I view situations. Um, for those of you who have spent time with specialists in any given area, we could stand up a person in front of us and the biologist is going to have very different things to say than a sociologist would or than a theologian or than um, someone of the same race, someone from a different race, someone of the same gender and so on. We tend to see different things uh, in, in objects because we're sensitized to them differently. We, have, we bring frameworks to them and values to them. Now, all of this is not, it shouldn't be, it, it's not necessarily threatening to a Christian position. Um, it's, especially if you confess that God, God is the context for everything. God provides the ultimate context for thing. And his narrative of creation, redemption, and consummation provide context for history, then everything takes on its meaning in that context. That doesn't mean that this is uh, not without problems, but it, just to say, this, the way that this uh, sensitizes us to language structures and culture and our presuppositions and so on is not necessarily in itself a threat to Christianity, I don't think. Okay, moving on. Uh, three implications of Derrida's thought in real basic <coughs> terms. The kind of where the rubber meets the road. Three implications. Meaning is never closed because context isn't closed. And we saw that with Orozco's photograph of New York City. Context isn't necessarily closed, at least not from our point of view. It might be closed from God's point of view. Maybe not, I don't know. There's a big, that's actually, that gets in, that's <laughs> a can of worms. But it might be closed from God's point of view, but we don't have a God's eye point of view. That's the point. You're within these contexts. Secondly, meanings, and by extension, worldviews, are extensively conditioned by cultural systems, language systems. Language systems and cultural systems. You relate to the world differently because you know what the internet is than people who lived 50 years ago. I mean, I think you think about the world in totally different terms because you live in an internet world. <laughs> you live in a cell phone world. And so on. It just, and that doesn't mean that truth goes out the window or dissolves into just f sort of free-floating signifiers, but it does mean that Meanings are conditioned by that. You do think differently because of internet and cell phone, and so on, and Biola and the Bible and all of those things that condition your worldview. Third, these cultural systems are never neutral, to get back to where we started this lecture. They always involve some sort of a cultural order, and that cultural order can be said to have some sort of power in it. You track that train of thought? Okay. 
They're never neutral. And this last, you guys got that? Can I move on? Uh, the, this is where we go next, then, <laughs> in Derrida's train of thought. So, so they're never closed. You always see them through some sort of cultural system. And those cultural systems aren't neutral. They order the world in certain ways. Um, that gets us to the second of these uh, philosophers, named Michel Foucault, is how you pronounce that. Michel Foucault. And he says, power is knowledge. What does that make you think of? Have any, have any of you heard something similar to that before? Knowledge is power. Yeah. Um, which comes from where? Uh, uh, Francis Bacon? I think it's Francis. I always get Roger and Francis confused. I think it's Francis. Um, Francis Bacon, who is a kind of I, I suppose one could say a, a uh, kind of fits in the modernist paradigm. And what does he mean by knowledge is power? Well, whoever knows how to do things has power, right? If you know how to invest money, that gives you a great deal more ability to affect your life situation and affect the life situations of others than if you don't know how to invest money, if you don't know how uh, a mortgage works, or if you don't know uh, where Metzger is, where the administration building is, uh, then you have less ability to affect your situation than if you do know that, those things, right? So Francis Bacon tells us knowledge is power. It empowers us to do certain things. So what does Foucault mean by reversing the order? Knowledge is power. What does that mean? Uh, being in a position of power gives me knowledge? Yeah. Ah, good, yeah. Uh, you, you could, you could uh, summarize it as the, the winner's right history. Yeah. That it's not just that those of us who are in power or have power, and we should think of power not just in terms of political rule, like as though the president has power and you don't have any, <laughs> right? You've got all sorts of ways that you have ability to do things uh, with your life. That's all power in one way or another. Um, and so he's, by reversing this power is knowledge, he's saying those of you who have the ability to change your situation and to affect the situations of others have the ability to change and affect what they know and what you know. Your ability to change something is, is wrapped up in knowledge. Um, if you have the ability, for instance, to determine what MTV broadcasts or CNN broadcasts, you have the ability to shape what people think about and what they consider to be true and real and valuable. So uh, he, he kind of, if knowledge is power, and we have to say, yeah, that's true to a great extent. Knowledge provides power. Foucault wants to circle it back around and turn it into a loop, right? The knowledge is power and power is knowledge, and the two influence each other back and forth. So what does he mean by this? And we'll try to, I'll try to move a little quicker, skip over a few things. First, he certainly means that knowledge is always constituted within and shaped by social systems. Human behavior is always ordered in one way or another. And that doesn't mean that anyone is controlling it. It just means that it's ordered. It's, it's ordered by the where sidewalks are placed and uh, that there are street lights and that you're clothed right now. <laughs> <laughs> You've got those, that clothing from somewhere. That's all an ordering. And all of those orderings are social. And it's in those social systems that we get to know things and we get to uh, learn things and think about things. But that knowing and learning happens within social context. It's not just objective and removed and from nowhere, right? 
you know things and learn things as a 21-year-old living in La Mirada, California in 2011, and so on. With certain people that influence your life and certain people that don't. And in terms of artwork, uh, contemporary art becomes t really preoccupied with this. What are the social systems that are ordering our life? What is the system involved in uh, mass production? How does that order our life in certain ways? Warhol gives, uh, shed some light on that, perhaps. How does celebrity culture shape what we know, what we think about, what we value? Um, we didn't, I cut the second lecture on the day we did Warhol because I was behind, so I just cut one. But one of the things we may have looked at is post-pop art, which might be uh, embodied by someone named Jeff Koons, who kind of sets up these consumer products like a vacuum cleaner and lights it and puts it in a case so it's a pristine thing. And there's this kind of pristine, uh, there's a pristineness to the vacuum cleaners and to cleanliness, a clean world, a clean home. But if you use these things, then they become dirty. <laughs> this is tension in Kuhn's work, always with a kind of displaying something that you can't have, really, or you can't, it can't remain both pristine and useful at the same time. And Kuhn's will go on to make these sort of monuments to childish desire. I guess you could call them childish desire. Yeah? I was wondering, like, does he ever actually make his own work? No. He yeah, he, 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 has, he has like 80 people working for him. And he has a, 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 a painting department and a sculpture department. <laughs> and he, uh, he, uh, works in his office designing things and then giving his people things to work on. Yeah. I mean, it's a factory, and he's pretty upfront. I mean, he really is a, he's post-pop, or neo-pop. I mean, he's, he's a war, it's the Warhol project, uh, updated and put in context of the 1990s and so on, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really make his own work. And, and all of the work is borrowed, or all of the forms are borrowed from pop culture, popular culture, and turned into massive, extremely expensive monuments of a, of a balloon dog, <laughs> or balloon flowers, or candy hearts. And all of them are so wrapped up in desire, a longing for um, something. Uh, 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 their desire, they're all wrapped up in desire. And that ties us back to Foucault, because after all, what he means by power is not, once again, a, an authoritarian power. He says this, power would be a fragile thing if its only function were to repress people, to keep people under control, to be repressive. If, on the contrary, power is strong, this is because it produces effects at the level of desire and also at the level of knowledge. That's a dark thing to say, but what he's saying is power, po what I mean by weak power is someone who controls people through laws, right? He would call that weak power. What he would call strong power is when you, you do something because you want to. <laughs> because you think it's the right thing to do and because you want to do it. If on a massive level, uh, it, you know, in our country for instance, we all watch television because we want to and we care about it, that exercises more power over us than the things that we are uh, actively resisting as being repressive. Right? Yeah. It linked to inception. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, strong power operates on the level of desire. Um, and contemporary art, conceptual art, is going to take that and run with it. 
specifically taking the conceptual strategy of interrupting systems so that we pay attention to them, interrupting the, the operation of language and cultural systems in whatever way, taking that strategy and turning it specifically and directly to the places and the subject matter about which we have desire. What we desire is what they're going to interrupt. So Jenny Holzer is uh, one example of an artist who <laughs> uh, does things like this. She uh, creates all these statements, these one-liners, what she calls truisms, that are these sort of pithy phrases about everything. Some of them contradictory, uh, all over the board, sort of truisms that people exchange with each other. And she inserts them into all of these social contexts where people expect to get messages, advertising messages or whatever, and she inserts them in a way that sort of, what is that an advertisement for? <laughs> like this one, that she took out an ad in this uh, massive billboard, uh, electronic billboard in uh, Times Square in New York City that flashed up there for a period of time in between ads Protect me from what I want. I think I would have crashed my car if I would have seen that. What? <laughs> a billboard is telling me what? What is it telling me? Who's the me? Who's the I here? Is it the sign speaking? Protect me from what I want. Is it the advertiser? Is it me? Is this my voice? Protect me from what I want. It disrupts the process of wanting in relation to a sign at any rate. Um, Barbara Kruger is another artist that would play with this. Uh, using the language of graphic design and the conventions of graphic design to sort of interrupt graphic design in a bit and interrupt the messages. Remote control. <laughs> uh, that's clever. Uh, remote control uh, linked to the desire of chocolate, or the desire for something. Our desires do exercise power over us. Um, Kruger goes a little over, I mean, she goes quite a bit overboard. If you look closely at her work, uh, they get a little, no, they get awfully shrill, um, but uh, she she's, uh, was very influential, 80s and 90s, and certainly needs to, you need to be aware of her. Um, and this is one of her more interesting ones, I think. You are not yourself. Ooh, that's haunting. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, she forces the question. Who are you? Where do you get you? How much of advertising determines who you are and how you behave and what you want and so on? Cindy Sherman, and we're going to see photography coming uh, uh, to the foreground here more and more. Um, Cindy Sherman, most of you are probably familiar with, if you've taken any photo. Yeah. Um, and what is Cindy Sherman's project? She has this early on in her career in the late 70s, she has this series called Untitled Film Stills, in which she photographs herself kind of playing stereotypical roles of the sort of female actor, um, like the scared, you know, the scared young woman who moves to New York City and is threatened by the tall buildings and, <laughs> and everyone around her. Um, and they're not, she's not rehearsing or quoting specific films, but you feel like you recognize it, you feel like you've seen it before. She plays on those, those signs that we're familiar with, or those kind of the roles we're familiar with. And she does this over and over again, these kind of tropes, these uh, uh, stereotypical female roles. Oh, it's so dreamy, <laughs> so, is the line that goes with the one on the left, right? The housewife who doesn't take any lip from no one versus the woman who's sort of what? Scared, sneaking out, 
or whatever is going on, but they link up to uh, narratives that you think you know. Um, and uh, I, I, you'll have noticed that uh, we've been looking at a lot of male artists up to this point, white male artists specifically. Um, this whole conversation is going to really start to involve uh, female artists and um, artists, kind of non-white non male artists, I guess is one way of saying it, um, who are interested in this whole, this whole conversation of how social systems shape our roles and shape our relationships to each other, shape what we mean by female or male, feminine, masculine, white, black, Latino, and so on. And so you have the emergence during this time period, 70s, 80s, 90s, of feminist artwork. Feminist artwork is gonna be most important in the 70s and 80s, probably, with some of these artists that I've shown you. And hopefully I'll get back and show you a few more later on. But also of uh, African-American artists, like Romare Bearden, who takes, I mean, he's constructing uh, black figures from Pittsburgh in this instance, and how's he constructing them? Yeah, through photos, but photos that have been removed from magazines, one would think, from different photographic material out there and assembled into figures. So that the figures are kind of uh, collages or assembled from media images. You get the, the kind of overtones of that. That we read our spaces in one way or another through the lens of media. And at this time, kind of after Warhol, in light of Warhol and so on, media, mass media is going to be one of the primary um, uh, social systems, social context that artists are gonna be concerned with in the ways they shape us and shape how we regard each other. And that will also go for a kind of a, a writing of history. Sherman and others are going to start critiquing history, <laughs> the writing of history, the writing of art history. And as we saw with Fred Wilson, who is African American, the telling of history and the displaying of history. Okay, you following that train of thought though? Derrida, Foucault, our last, uh, oh, and in light of this, this is where deconstruction is going to take up a political, is going to take up political content in a really strong way, uh, is that um, what is deconstruction specifically aimed at? disrupting uh, unjust, unjust uh, social si situations, meanings, um, ways that we refer to two things and the relationship between two things in ways that are unjust. And that's, uh, as Derrida goes on and on, uh, later in his life, he's gonna say, deconstruction is all about justice which is not something you usually hear. <laughs> we think deconstruction is just about playing, and it often was used in that way, irresponsible cultural play. Um, for Derrida, it's about um, creating more just uses of language and of, of culture for whatever that's worth. Whether you think deconstruction actually did that in practice or not, that's uh, how it was intended. Okay, uh, we're out of time. So we gotta call it, uh, and we can call it here. This is, we'll, we'll just end. The, the last guy I was gonna introduce to you is Lyotard Jean-Francois. Lyotard, I define postmodern as incredulity towards meta-narratives, a disbelief in the ability of someone to say with certainty, explain with certainty, history, <laughs> the world, um, meta-narratives. And specifically, he's interested in science being unable to do that. Uh, we often are threatened in the church by 
his incredulity towards meta narratives, and we take that really personally because we do have a meta narrative um, that it, that proclaims what history means and what this world, what the ultimate context of this world is. But Lyotard isn't really all that interested in. He's not concerned with how religion does this. He's concerned with how science does this and philosophy does this. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.